Welcome to Greens Academy. Dear students, in today's video, we are going to focus on four popular poems of John Dryden, Absalom and Achitophel, Macflecno, A Song for St. Cecilia's Day, Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music. Let's get right into it. Hope you are all ready to take notes. Please keep in mind this video is presented to help students with net exam. John Dryden, known for his brilliant use of heroic couplets, he was a master of form and metre. His works are often considered a bridge between the Shakespearean age and the age of enlightenment. His influence was so significant that the period from 1660 to 1700 is often referred to as the age of Dryden. Dear students, one of Dryden's most well-known works is Absalom and Achitophel. Let's delve into the heart of this masterpiece. Absalom and Achitophel is a political verse satire by John Dryden. This lengthy poem consists of 1,031 lines. Do you know in how many parts Absalom and Achitophel was published? Yes, you're right, in two parts. The first part published in the year 1681, the second part was published in the year 1682, but second part was largely composed by Nahum Tate, playwright and contemporary of John Dryden. Dryden contributed only 200 lines. Hope this is clear, this wonderful poem is written in heroic couplets. Dear students, the poem tells the biblical tale of the rebellion of Absalom against King David. Dryden used this biblical allegory to represent three important political events of his time. Now let's understand the political background of this poem. First is the Popish plot, which happened in the year 1678. This plot is an alleged plot by Catholics against King Charles II. Next political event is the Exclusion Crisis. This is brought to exclude James, brother of King Charles II, from inheriting the throne after Charles's death. This problem went on for two long years, that is from 1679 until 1681. The third political plot is the Monmouth Rebellion that happened in the year 1685. This is an attempt made to put the king's illegitimate son James, Duke of Monmouth, on the throne. All these three political twists and turns Dryden discusses in this poem. The major political figure cited in this poem who is reason, behind all these crises, is the Earl of Shaftesbury and his Catholic supporters. They were in favour of the King's illegitimate son, James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, and not James, the brother of King Charles II. Now you may have a natural question. Why Earl of Shaftesbury supports James Scott, King's illegitimate son? And why not James, who is having a royal lineage? The simple answer is James Scott is a Protestant, and Earl of Shaftesbury wants a Protestant ruler and not a Catholic ruler. Such a sensitive topic, but Dryden dealt this using an allegorical poem. This allegorical approach allowed Dryden to comment on the political tensions of his time without directly criticizing the monarchy or the parliament. Now let's understand the religious allegory used in this poem. In this poem, Absalom represents James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, King Charles II, illegitimate son. Next, King David stands for King Charles, the evil counsellor Achitophel for Earl of Shaftesbury. Lastly, Zimri stands for the second Duke of Buckingham. Dear students, hope you understood this biblical allegory. Let's move on to the summary of this poem. King David, the ruler of Israel, has got many illegitimate children. The poem describes that polygamy was not a sin at this time and having illegitimate children is justified. In pious times, air priestcraft did begin, before polygamy was made a sin. Of all illegitimate children, King David loves Absalom and accepts Absalom's wishes. Absalom was a strong and handsome man and people of Israel liked him. He became popular even outside his country. But very quickly things started to change. David's rule does not remain peaceful. The Jews often complain about the king and his rule. They began to threaten the government. Achitophel, a wise and witty counselor of David's, sees this as his moment to ruin King David. He decided to turn Absalom against his father King David. Achitophel praises Absalom, telling him that it is a shame his low birth excludes him from taking the throne. Absalom sees himself as destined for greatness. Achitophel devises his plan and sends Absalom out to the people to turn them against his father. Achitophel warns the young man of his uncle and tells him he must try for the crown while his father still lives. Absalom goes before the people and speaks. 
Few words, he said, but easy, those and fit, more slow than Hybla drops and far more sweet. Dryden elegantly and brilliantly used these words to show how Absalom was able to at last King David speaks, asserting his authority and legitimacy. Students, as we know, a king is a king right. King David clears all disagreement and declared his kingship. All his enemies remained helpless and stunned. Now let's embrace some famous lines from John Dryden's poem, Absalom and Achitophel, first quotation. Great wits are sure to madness near allied. Dryden says, true genius often comes from a mind that refused to obey conventional logic and finds inspiration in chaos. This is a clear and a definite attack on Achitophel, who represents Earl of Shaftesbury. Such a beautiful satire, is that right? Yes. Other popular lines are, all empire is no more than power in trust, nor is the people's judgment always true. Beware the fury of a patient man. This line, beware the fury of a patient man, represents King Charles II, who is seeing quietly all political drama happening during exclusion crisis. John Dryden's poem Absalom and Achitophel has several themes including 1. Political satire, 2. Biblical allegory, 3. Power and ambition, 4. Temptation, sin, fall, and punishment, and finally 5. God, religion, and the divine right of kings. I believe you all got a fair idea about this poem and noted down important points. Another remarkable piece from Dryden's portfolio is Mac Fleckno. Students, this poem is important from exam point of view. Coming back to our discussion, this mock heroic poem is a satirical masterpiece, penned with Dryden's signature wit and biting humor. The poem Mac Fleckno has a subtitle, A Satyr Upon the True Blue Protestant Poet, T.S. This poem, which is a mock heroic poem published in 1682. The poem is an attack on Thomas Shadwell, a well-known playwright. There are several reasons for enmity between Shadwell and Dryden. Both had different political affiliations. Dryden was a Tory and Shadwell was a Whig. Both had different religious affiliations. Shadwell satirized Catholic and Anglican priests in a play titled The Lancashire Witches and Teg O'Develli, the Irish priest. This work offended Dryden at a time when he was considering conversion to Catholicism. Not only that, both had different literary ideals and preferences. While Dryden preferred Shakespeare, Shadwell idolized Johnson. Dryden preferred comedy of wit, while Shadwell comedy of humors. Dryden earlier criticized Shaftesbury in his satirical poem, The Medal. This provoked Dryden's opponent Thomas Shadwell, and he wrote the Medal of John Bayes as the answer for the satire. Finally, Dryden gave a reply by the publication of McFleckno. Dryden's satirical prowess shines through the characters he creates. In the poem, Dryden portrays Shadwell as Mac. Students, who is this Mac? He is the son of Richard Fleckno. Mac is the dullest son of Fleckno who never deviates into sense. Now Fleckno chooses Shadwell as his heir to the throne of dullness and expresses the hope that his son advance in new ignorance and dullness. Shadwell's enormous stupidity is highlighted throughout the poem. His corpulence, his mountain belly and his addiction to opium are referred to. The poem ends by drawing a parallel to the biblical story of the mantle of Elijah falling on the shoulders of Elisha, giving him a double portion of his sire's prophetic spirit. Dryden incorporates it within the verses, making each line a delightful blend of wit and satire. Dear students, take for instance he describes Shadwell as a goodly fabric of stupidity, a line that is as humorous as it is biting. Dryden's sharp wit and keen observation are evident in the way he uses imagery and metaphor. Consider the lines where he describes the coronation of Shadwell, the realms of nonsense yield to thee, a metaphor that perfectly captures the absurdity of Shadwell's reign. Finally, we can understand, dear students, McFleckno stands as a testament to Dryden's ability to combine wit, satire, and poetic brilliance. Now let's turn our attention to a song for St. Cecilia's Day. This ode was written in the year 1687. A song for St. Cecilia's Day is separated into eight stanzas. It is interesting to note that the first seven verses are sung by a single voice, while the last stanza is meant for the grand chorus. Since this is a song for St. Cecilia's Day, on the 22nd of November 1687, it has such a musical structure, starting with a single voice and ending with a grand chorus. The first stanza is the longest one, it contains 15 lines. If you look at the poem closely, you can see that the line count decreases till the fourth stanza. Thereafter, the line count increases gradually 
Next students, when it comes to rhyming pattern, this poem does not have a specific rhyming pattern. Dryden chooses the alternative and closed rhyme scheme. It opens with a grand cosmic vision of music's divine origin. You can observe this theme resonates throughout the entire poem. Dryden uses each instrument to represent a different facet of the universe. This includes from the celestial spheres to the human soul. The theme of music as a divine art is central to the poem. Saint Cecilia's significance in the poem is profound. She does not merely represent music, she embodies it. The poem ends in a powerful crescendo with the introduction of the organ. This musical instrument associated with Saint Cecilia herself. The organ's music, according to Dryden, has the power to raise the dead. And in Saint Cecilia, he finds the perfect embodiment of this divine harmony, a saint who sings with the voice of the heavens. Through a song for Saint Cecilia's day, Dryden successfully encapsulates the divine and harmonious nature of music. John Dryden wrote his second ode, Alexander's Feast, or Power of Music. This ode was written in the year 1697, in celebration of Saint Cecilia's day. It is interesting to note that ten years after his first tribute, a song for Saint Cecilia's day, he wrote, This Alexander's Feast. The poem, Alexander's Feast, has a subtitle, The Power of Music. Students note down this subtitle. The poem has seven stanzas, vary in length with each, engaging in much repetition. This gives a pleasing effect to the poem. The poem begins at the feast of Alexander the Great. He celebrates his victory over the Persian army and captures Persepolis. A bard or a poet named Timotheus is invited for a musical performance at the feast. Dear students, this poem is one of my favorite poem. Surely you can realize the persuasive power of music in this poem. First, the bard begins with a song that glorifies Alexander the Great. The song inflates the monarch's sense of pride. Second, the bard then invokes Bacchus, the god of wine, dance and festivities. This encourages the king to drink. Then the bard Timotheus shifts to a sadder tune. He sings about the dead Persian king Darius. He praises the beauty of Thais, the sweetheart of Alexander the Great. This song now encourages the king to be grateful for his love with Thais. Alexander is thrilled and filled with joy. Dear students, now wait and see the punchline of our Timotheus. Now Timotheus sings of vengeance. This causes Alexander and Thais to set fire to Persepolis. The poem closes as the speaker compares Timotheus to the Catholic martyr Saint Cecilia. We know Saint Cecilia also got the power of moving listener's heart with her musical performance. Such a wonderful poem ends with the line, He raised a mortal to the skies, she drew an angel down. These lines refer to the power of music to move people's emotions. Timotheus's music is so powerful that it can make Alexander feel like a god. Timotheus' music can also make the angels descend from heaven. The line is also a metaphor for the power of art to transform our lives. Let's take a moment to revisit the poems we've discussed today. 1. Absalom and Achitophel, a masterpiece of heroic couplets, is an exquisite example of Dryden's ability to infuse his work with political commentary. Then we delved into Mac Fleckno, a mock heroic poem dripping with sarcasm and biting wit. Here Dryden employs humor and irony to critique his literary rival Thomas Shadwell. And finally two odes by Dryden. 1. A Song for St. Cecilia's Day 2. Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music. Dear students, though John Dryden's works firmly rooted in the 17th century, they continue to resonate with modern readers. Thanks for joining us on this poetic journey. Dear students, keep learning, keep growing.